Sunrise Safari. We are coming to you live from Juma Private Game Reserve on the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park, part of the great Limpopo Transfrontier Park, some eight and a half million acres of South African wilderness land. Well, Mozambican and Zimbabwean as well. My name is James Hendry. That is my winning morning smile. On camera today we have got the Viking. Give us a thumb, Viking. There we go. Uh, <laughs> and we are going to be traversing this uh, reserve called Juma, uh, hopefully finding a male leopard called Maripse. That's my idea. We had his tracks around the camp earlier today and we had them yesterday as well. We are being joined from Amakala down in the Eastern Cape, Karicha down in the Eastern Cape, and of course by Cedric here. Currently, we are looking at some impalas, and they are enjoying a delicious meal upon a termite mound. Yum, yum. And while we look at them, please remember to talk to us. We'd love to have your questions and comments. It's always nice to hear from you. You're an integral part of what we do here, and your wants, desires, and interests really do make a huge part of these shows. There is a wildebeest. Well, there was a wildebeest. There he is now. There were three of them here. A vast herd of three wildebeest, and they are lurking in amongst the impalas. We've just popped out of camp onto the clearings here, hoping to perhaps hear some alarm calling. We haven't heard any alarm calling, but we have heard a hyena going whoop, whoop, way down to the south, which is uh, very nice to hear. It's kind of, um, how to describe it? It's a, uh, it's almost a nostalgic sound. And it's lovely to hear them calling. Hello, Wildlife Am, was it? Wildlife Am? Wildlife M? Uh, very nice that you are hoping for a wonderful sunrise safari. I am sure that you are joined by many others, including me. Oh, Wildlife Cam. Hello, Wildlife Cam, yes. Yes, we're all hoping for a wonderful sunrise safari. I can hear a loud chorus of Cape turtle doves going bru, 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 bru. There's some crickets that are stridulating their last before they go to sleep for the day hopefully to avoid being eaten by some bird or other woodland kingfishers chip purring grey-headed sparrows cheep cheeping and of course down in the little gullies and drainage lines the Franklins are just waking up. Lovely morning. All right, we're going to move along and you're going to have a brief weather report. Good morning, good morning everyone and welcome in a beautiful sunrise here at Prideland. We are um, really broadcasting here in Lover Dam. Look like it is really, really beautiful. The sun is rising perfectly and it seems like it will be overcast for a day. Uh, of course, from myself, Rexen and um, Owen behind the camera, we're looking for the great, great uh, morning. We'll head more to the east and look around. Maybe Fungati Pride might be coming out in the area. And let's enjoy the beautiful sunrise, of course. It tend to be like uh, really, really showing that to the east and south, it might be a little bit uh, hot, but uh, later on in the area, it can be a little bit of a change. I can see from the distance, look like a lonely impala might be making its way slowly towards the 
water hole but we are really heading it as a plan of a day and let's enjoy the sunrise It will be busy. It looks like it will be a busy morning here. I had the quite a lot of doves calling different orioles and uh, red bulls, hornbills, a lot more species of birds that are really giving a beautiful song. It sings that uh, it could be. A lively morning, especially around this waterhole. It seems like we will have more activities in the course of a day by the look of the weather. Let's take this opportunity from Prideland, Lobo Dam, over to Saint to Cedric. Yes, thanks Rex and it is quite a nice morning. It is a little bit overcast but it's nice and fresh. Finally we can actually start a morning, a nice fresh morning here at uh, Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands, South Africa. Good morning everybody, my name is Cedric Dold and behind the camera here on Sparky we've got Muscles and Paul. So yes, thanks for joining us on our wonderful sunrise safari. I'm hoping that we are going to find fantastic things. I'm just listening out here. I've just stopped here. I'm on the northern side of uh, Juma at the moment. I'm just listening out because I uh, thought I did hear something calling uh, just south of us. And I've just got, uh, looks like maybe a female leopard tracks that's on the, on the road here at the moment heading in a westly direction towards a road called Gallego Shortcut. And uh, so I might uh, actually uh, turn around just now and see if I can follow up on this uh, on these tracks because it is very very fresh but it's not large tracks I know that there's a female leopard that hangs uh, around on our boundary on the northern boundary of uh, Juma and her name is Kara so I'm hoping it is her because it's not as the tracks is not as large as uh, as the lumbers but I'm just trying to see if I can get a nice one here because the track is very very uh, how can I say faint Anna Marie, good morning. Yes, definitely it is uh, Saturday Cat Day. So I'm also hoping that we are going to find some nice uh, feline friends for us this morning. And uh, you yeah, never know. And I know, I think James uh, said he's hot on the tail of a young male leopard, maybe old Marips, that came down from our camp heading south. So I'm hoping James comes right that side. Other than that, you never know, because I know that that uh, Nkuma line, um, she went south towards Baboon Pan last night. So I might actually end up going that side uh, if I'm not, uh, or if I don't come right with this female leopard. But I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn around here and, yeah, let's turn around. I just want to see if I can get another track. I don't want to just see exactly where she turned in here. Because I know Kara, she hangs around on this Biffles uh, cut line and then she'll go along. Sometimes well, she'll go you know, a little bit into our property, but I'm not, not too sure how far. But let's just go take a look. Yep. Oh, yeah, and see that. As I said, the tracks are so faint here at the moment because this road is very hard in the center. So it's very difficult to take a look at these tracks. I just want to see slowly but surely what I can get here. If I can get get nice ones here. Mm. No, I'm gonna carry on. <laughs> Ladybug Sarah, yes, definitely. It'll be the perfect 
Actually, well, there's a few marula trees here that's perfect for a leopard, eh? but I think uh, uh, it would be nice having a leopard just lying in a tree for us and just waiting for a good old view. But uh, I'm just double checking. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to miss this track because it's just now. If this track goes off the road and goes north or it goes south, I don't want to kind of get the wrong direction. There's some nice soft sand here, yeah, so if I can, I'm hoping I can actually get to show you a track here. If there is any tracks here, do do do. No, I don't see anything. I see a hyena tracks. All right, let's go back. Yeah, I think she might have cut across into the side here, yeah, so I'm just going to go a little bit forward. There's another road here called uh, Rexon's uh, Shortcut. So I'm going to try to do Rexon's Shortcut and go back towards Galigo. Uh, Galigo Shortcut Road. I also love the early mornings like this because, you know, the, the predators are still moving around. It's still quite active and it's nice and fresh this morning. Not too hot. So, you know, that's why we try and follow up on a, a track as quick as possible, hoping to locate Leopardo. Hello. Let's go around from that side. That'll be the better, better option. It could have been, yeah, I don't think it's Tlalamba, but I think it's just too, the, the track is just too small. Tlalamba's track is much larger. And Cora's not a big female. Well, her mother is quite big, but yeah, I don't think she's too big. And talking about Kara and talking about uh, uh, Kara's mom, Shudulu, I don't know if everybody's heard that uh, sh they have found Shudulu with uh, two little cubs on Arethusa. Of course, the area has been zoned because the cubs are still very small, apparently around about three, three and a half week old. So, and they've seen two cubs. So, Shudulu has got two cubs at the moment, which is fantastic. Good on her. I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. And they also found tortoise pan. Uh, tracks there at the den site as well, so almost like a confirmation that he is the father of those cubs. Now we have stopped at a rather attractive termite mound. Is it not attractive? Yes, it is. And I'm also going to show you some glorious grass, which I shall bring around there. Uh, it is called Megathyrus maximus. Megathyrus maximum, sorry, Megathyrus. It used to be called Panicum, but now it is called Megathyrus. And I'm sure that many of you despite the fact that you would like to see a leopard or a lion or a wild dog will be extremely excited to see Megathyrus. Can you see Megathyrus, Olaf? Does it impress you? Yes. yes, it impresses me enormously that we have got Megathyrus. Because I know that many of you have secretly wanted to see Megathyrus during the course of the night or uh, the early morning, depending on where you are in the world. Now here, we have got some fresh building going on from some termites. Hello. Yes. Lovely smell of fresh earth there. Now we're going to make like a chimpanzee and collect some termites. I don't know if you know this or not, but chimpanzees actually really do do what I've just done there. They will dip sticks or pieces of grass. I'm not sure if they use megathyrus, but they use various pieces of grass to pull termites out of mounds like this, and then they eat them. There you can see the termites. Can you see them? On the end of our little piece of grass. Can you see them there? There are the termites, and those are the soldier termites that have set to beating up this piece of megathyrus grass because they think that it is going to harm them. Anyway, that's what's going on here. Now they're building like this in order to, well, expand the mound and then also to create the, 
uh, convective current that air conditions things down here. And they, unlike us, are not affected by load shedding, which means that they can have air conditioning regardless of whether or not the national power utility, which is a compliment it doesn't deserve, gives them power or not, which I think is quite nice for them. And the other thing to see around here, I'm just, I can see one here, but I can't see it, see one anywhere else on this. Oh, here's one. Um, I don't think you're going to be able to see that, though. Olaf, if I put my piece of grass there, can you see what I'm looking at? Okay, so that's a little hole in the ground. And that was being used at one stage for the allate emergence that would have taken place at earlier in the season. That's when the flying termites when came out into the world full of hope that they would uh, become the new kings and queens of a mound such as this one, the originators of a magnificent construction like this. Of course, they had less than a one in a thousand chance of ever surviving. Uh, most of them would have ended up in the gullets of birds and reptiles and amphibians and uh, mammals, actually. So that's, that's this wonderful termite mound. The last thing I'm going to say about this magnificent termite mound is that its extent is really quite impressive. Thank you, James Richard. I'm glad you're enjoying this discussion. I enjoy this, these little discussions as well. You can see where I'm walking that this termite mound extends well beyond the ex exposition, I suppose, you'd say, out of the ground. It is the proverbial tip of the iceberg, as it were, and it goes under the road here. And I think that this mound is very ancient. It has been here certainly since I've been knocking about these lands, which is uh, now whoosh, seven years or so, I suppose. Can you believe it? Longer than I was at high school. And I hope that it will last um, many, many decades to come. We're now going to carry on in our leopard quest, and you're going to go up to Cedric, who has not found a leopard, but he has found a much bigger animal. Can you guess what it is? Yes, I've got two nice uh, male elephants busy playing around. Yeah, just like not a serious fight or anything like that. I think it's just two young boys that's just practicing their uh, sparring techniques. And uh, as you can see, oh, that one's just showing his strength to the other one now. So, yeah, it's nice just to see these males having a bit of a, a game. But if it's a real fight, you'll find that uh, the shoving is much more aggressive and it becomes quite intense. But uh, for now, you can just see a little bit of a, more of a little game than anything else. That poor tree, hopefully that tree doesn't get in the way there because sometimes when these elephants are having a bit of a play fight like this, they don't even care about the tree. Oh, <laughs> like that one. My name is Byron Loebscher and I am a naturalist on the Penguin Beach Show based down at Stony Point in Betty's Bay. What I really love about the African penguin is the conservation they afford other species because they are what is known as a charismatic megafauna. And charismatic megafauna have the ability to touch people's hearts and promote conservation of that area. My favorite questions from the viewers. 
are the questions that I don't have the answers to. So the more challenging the question, the better for me, because I feel like it is great that I can go back and research. And what I love about Wild Earth and Penguin Beach is that I can share my passion for the natural world with viewers on a global scale and promote the conservation of this very special little species, the African penguin. Oh, sorry, welcome back again this side. I am still sitting with these two male elephants that's still busy with their game, their shoving game. Oh, look at that, it's going in. <laughs> yeah, I do apologize for losing my feet there, but uh, of course well, I'm still here and I'm glad you are still with us. I want to try and reposition here, but I'm not going to do that. I'm rather just, especially with the elephants that's playing around, sometimes they'll just like turn around and start running away from the other one. And then, yeah, I don't want to be that person that's going to be in the in that pathway. So I'm going to sit just here. I enjoy this moment with these two. I'm hoping that the game does not get too aggressive, but it doesn't look like it. As I said, it is still just practice for these two young males. Oh, don't don't take it out on the tree. Oh, poor tree is in the middle. <laughs> And you can just see that uh, the temporal gland now on the one on the left starting to leak. So it's just excitement. Sometimes it starts having that fluid that will start coming down, uh, especially when they do get excited or agitated. Uh, it starts leaking. Mm, poor, poor bush willow. Luckily, it's a bush willow, and a bush willow is a tough tree. So that one is definitely taking a lot of. Uh, Quite a bit of a beating from these two males. Yep, looks like yep, looks like the game is maybe not over. No, maybe it looks like he wants some more. No, oh, Pauline, I'm sure they do. I'm sure. I mean, sometimes those tusks are quite sharp and, uh, I mean, they're very strong. So I'm sure sometimes just a little bit of a wrong move or something, it can do a little bit of injuries, you know, make uh, a hole or something like that in the ear or on the side. But I don't think anything too fatal, especially when it's play, play fighting. I think they know exactly, you know, how far they can take it and push uh, the, the game. So yeah, but it's but when it comes to real sparring, when it comes to real kind of uh, competing against each other for female, a female that's in heat and that, then it can end up uh, fatal. I mean, there has been that uh, situation where they found a tusk embedded into another male's uh, skull. Um, of course, with that power, Oof, that one's getting pushed out there now. I'm finished now. He's still playing. There is a third male, yeah, but we can't see it. It's just a little bit further down from where we are now. And clearly, he's not interested in this play fight. I might just go. It looks like they're moving a little bit further in, so I'm just going to go a little bit forward. Sorry, the um, Paul. I'm just going to go a little bit forward just to see. Yeah, 
I don't want to go too far in front. Because it looks like they've just moved a little bit further in. So, oh yeah, they are now. All right. I shall just sit on this side. Well, I can see why this one tree is actually still standing up here because it's a nice uh, bush willow, as I say. They're very, it's a very strong tree and, uh, and it's quite a thick one, but they make it look so thin. Such a huge uh, animal. And they just crash over everything if they need to. Lino, yes, definitely. Elephants are absolutely, it's an amazing uh, animal. Uh, I love uh, elephants. I can sit and watch elephants all day. I think I've said it numerous times. Uh, it's, uh, it's an animal, especially you just follow them while they're feeding, while they go down to a watering hole, while they are busy play fighting like this. It is just such a nice animal. It's a beautiful, beautiful, like a gentle giant to me. Hello, my name is Melanie and I'm sitting in freezing cold Hobart, Tasmania, which is a small island off the coast of Australia. I became an explorer for Wild Earth quite a number of years ago when they first advertised the positions. I'm so excited about winning the Rock Fig um, Prize, uh, which will be in the big way, and I cannot wait to have that adventure. And I thank the organisers um, so much for this opportunity. Lavik, welcome. Good. Welcome everyone here. We are looking at this uh, beautiful head of uh, elephant. It's really interesting here. From myself, Rexon, uh, this m morning and uh, Owen behind the camera, we're looking for the great, great uh, morning. It is a pleasure, of course. We have located the elephant here, Pride Land, south of the uh, 
in Lovey Dam itself. It's just amazing. We've been looking for elephants yesterday and we finally find them in the area. It is really, really amazing. Would like, of course, anyone that joined us for the morning, you are very much welcome. You can send us question or comment or anything that you'd like us to chat about. It's a great, great uh, morning. We're really looking forward to really work around to the south. This is our first area. I mean, first time for me to come a little bit more to the south. I find more activities of animals that moving in the area. It could be something that holds this uh, elephant down the side. It could be water. And I believe that uh, it could be more species as far as Ngati pride. Also, the movement uh, around the area. We've seen a bit of tracks of hyenas. And I believe that uh, the wild dogs might be also in the surrounding. We look like uh, we're heading this elephant. I mean, this elephant are heading kind of more to the north, northeast. Maybe finally there might be around um, the uh, Lobo Dam later on. If not, there might be carry on towards the the HQ direction as they move but I believe that today is one of the good day for all these elephant to come down weather have changed of course it's gonna be a little bit hot here I just calculate the up to three to four the environment it's really restrict a little bit you cannot know how many are there because it's very thick here it we are very limited to see how many elephants are involved in this uh, herd itself. But they're very chill and relaxed. I love this breeding herd of elephant. The female itself, you tend to see her, she's really, really relaxed. And we know that in nature, elephant, they control by matriarch. A matriarch, it seems like, uh, is the in, I mean, is the in charge of the whole head of the elephant. As the matriarch is more relaxed, the whole head is going to be the same. If a matriarch is not relaxed, it's going to really signal the rest of the individual members to be responding on the on the vehicle if they come around. But uh, by the look of the thing, this is beautiful, beautiful head of the elephant. More relaxed, accommodating vehicles. We are more than one vehicle here, but they're not even reacting, which is lovely to see that. Elijah asking question, how can we protect ourselves from elephant? In most cases, before even elephant react to you, you need to really first study how that particular uh, elephant behaving. If the elephant that is not uh, relaxed with vehicles, of course, don't come so close. It's how actually we protect ourselves in most cases. You first have to study that uh, behavior of the animal before even taking decision to get close to an animal or view the animal itself. But especially coming with the tourists or we want to view an elephant while we're here, you have to all the time you look at the behavior first, whether the elephant respond or not respond. That could be a, a great defense from ourselves. But if the elephant is chilled, we tend to see coming down. How can you get to see that? You look at the body a language of an elephant. If it gets to see vehicle, if it raises the head up, you know that uh, you're not safe on that uh, area. You have to be distance. There is a comfort zone, of course, of this animal. If you come with a vehicle, there will be a distance that will let you that I'm not comfortable with your present. You're getting close. So all of those zones you need to read. Alert zone and the warning zone and the critical zone. These animals, they always offer you that. So you have to be all the time you know that uh, these animals uh, now in, we are in a comfort zone. They're happy with our present. We cannot even go further from here. It's, it's our defense while we're out here. But most of the elephant, of course, they are not that much aggressive, especially in this area where the vehicles are always viewing these animals. The only dangerous animal is those who get hunted in different areas of the country. You know that uh, seeing vehicle or we able to hear vehicle audio, they will respond. Let's try to reposition ourselves according to the movement of this elephant. Then we can able to read 
and calculate how many elephants are here. It seems like uh, the most, the majority of the elephants here, they are migrated out. So it's in the nature. And let's get this, take this opportunity over to Ralph. Hello, good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari where we're coming to you live from the Amakala Game Reserve down in the Eastern Cape. And we've come out with the idea of looking for lions this morning. I'd really like to find the little babies that uh, the female is walking around with. Yesterday afternoon we did see the two female lions that are in this area, but not the little babies as of yet. My name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera I've got Morgan. Good Morgan and good Morgan to all of you. There is a little moth on the lens itself. There's just get rid of that little bug that was there. So anyway, that's the idea for this morning. But we never know what's going to pop up in between. I've just come to a nice viewpoint. So we can look down into the Bushman's River Basin itself. Uh, and there are a few guides that are also looking for the lines as well. So there's a few of us out. Also just listening out as well because the male was very vocal yesterday evening and hoping that he may call and give away his position again this morning. But uh, nothing as of yet and it's pretty quiet. Nobody's really picked up on any signs of any animals just yet. I think the elephants have been spotted uh, a little bit towards the south of the reserve on the, on the southwestern side. But other than that, Everybody's still trying to find some animals. And, uh, well, it's been a beautiful start to the day. I think today's going to be quite warm. I don't think it's going to be as hot as the last few days, but you never know because uh, they do say that this heat wave is continuing on right through until Monday. So we also heard some reports yesterday with this heat wave that we've been having. There's actually been some deaths, and I'm talking humans, uh, up in the Northern Cape. Um, so that's very sad and just goes to show that with us having um, little warthog piglets that are dying, um, it's, uh, it's going right through from, from warthogs to humans um, where people are getting heat stroke. Um, it's extremely hot uh, during the day and uh, we've got to just remember to keep the hats on, the sunscreen, keep on drinking lots of water and just try and stay in the shade because... Uh, the sun has been so harsh, um, we've just got to be a little bit careful. Anyway, we're fine, I'm fine, Morgan's fine, and we'll keep on looking for these lions. So, Wilma, uh, thanks for jumping on board with us as well. Um, it's lovely to be out here, nice and fresh. It's probably my favorite time of the day. Uh, no sign as of yet of the cheetah. I have been spending quite a lot of time with them, so I didn't come out with the idea of going looking for them. But who knows, we might land up, if somebody does find them, we'll scoot on over and go and ca have a catch up with them. But for us this morning, I haven't seen these cubs uh, in quite a while. I'm talking the lions. And so that was just the idea for this morning was uh, to try and get a, a bit of an update from them. Yesterday we did see the secretary birds. They look very healthy and happy. So that was fantastic. Now it's time, I think, just to look for the lions. And as I say, that's the idea. But who knows what's going to jump up in between. You never know. Um, but uh, we'll stick to that plan. So we're going to start up and head on through, maybe look for some tracks and continuing listening out. And while we try and find some of our big cats, I think it's time to head to Rexon with not a big cat, but another big animal. Thanks, joining back again, we had this elephant 
Look like they're heading straight deeply into this block away from where we are. A little bit difficult for us to follow them here, but look like I've counted up to four individual uh, females that are in the area. It could be more than that. It's in the nature of uh, the breeding herd of elephant to be in numbers. You know that uh, elephant in the course of uh, daylight, early in the morning, if they are in a number of 50 or 100, they split up in a very small uh, groups in order to accommodate it by the ground and also moving into the area without having impact on the ground itself. Elephant is such a very smart and intelligent species. It's the only elephant that can do that. Most of the species that are gregarious or moving in head, buffalo, impala, they cannot even to manage themselves to be in the area without causing impact. I can see one there is moving slowly towards the um, thicket there. We might get to see them slowly by sure when they get into the open, a little bit of uh, the south of the tree itself. It looks like uh, they are promising. We might stay and follow them here and see where they might be ended to. But uh, I'm so happy because the direction that they're taking now, they're taking back towards the Lovo Dam itself. I would really appreciate to see them around the waterhole. The elephant is one of the most intelligent species with everything that they do out in the bush. Security, moving out in the area for uh, grazing. When it comes to elephant head itself, there they are so much protected. We all know that you tend to see elephant in most cases taking care of their babies. Anything that in the form of danger, they respond quickly as much as they can. Furthermore, how the elephant feed every day? That is maybe a question. It's really elephant feed 24 hours. There's a reason behind that. Elephant is one of the species that have a single chamber stomach. When they feed, when they collect food, they go to the sack and they be really to break down the, the food itself because they're not a uh, four chamber stomach. They rely on bacteria that they have in the sack to break down the food. There's reason most of the uh, plant or fruit that they really collect this time of the year, what's going to happen, they ferment inside and let, let these uh, bacteria break down the food and they come as it is. If it's a marula, most of the time you find that this, the marula will come without even getting touched. There will be some that will be go through the molars and able to be open up a little bit and able to squeeze the juice but the rest they will be like that they will rely on these bacteria to do so that's the reason these guys they spread out a lot of seeds in nature here for seeds like grass fruits more etc so the reason why the 24 hours they don't get uh, most of the nutrition on whatever they eat they might get few percentages that's the reason they keep on feeding all the time in order to keep the big body to sustain. So in 250 foliage that they collect a day, you might find that uh, it will be only 50%, 60% that will be... that will benefit on nutrition. Thank you. Joining me here, we, we now can see a little bit of two uh, Lexosonta Africana moving to the thicket. They're coming to the open slowly by shore, but we believe that uh, we're going to have our time here with this elephant. Maybe the visual is going to improve.
look like this a movement of elephants in our favor slowly coming towards our direction we'll wait here maybe it might be coming straight direct 12 o'clock to our vehicle i uh, believe the rest of them they might change direction and head straight to the east The sun is slowly breaking through the early morning mist and clouds, which is very nice. We've had a cool start to the morning, and now I suspect it is going to become volcanically hot within the next 10 or 15 minutes. Now, while I drive along without anything particularly biologically fascinating to look at, I just want to explain a, a, an experience I had last night. At one o'clock last night, the power went off, and that meant that the fan that was uh, moving the air, the hot air above my head, went off as well. And at about 17 minutes past one, I woke up. And I woke up because a cloud of mosquitoes had emerged from somewhere and was, I think, probably trying to carry me off somewhere to their lair because they were not being... Uh, dissuaded by the moving air around my room. And so it was that I had a fairly uncomfortable time until three o'clock this morning when the power returned. I just thought maybe you'd like to know that. Uh, maybe you wouldn't. Maybe you, uh, you don't care at all. But uh, that's, that's what I'm, I was telling you. That's what I, I felt I, I should tell you, I should uh, confess to. Uh, we just had a dove fly off, which was not a particularly fascinating bird, but um, there it went. Otherwise, I think we'll just continue along here. So we haven't found any tracks of uh, Maripta or any other leopard for that matter. And so we're going to go down to a waterhole. Oh, let's have a look at this Steinbock. There he goes, Olaf. Do you see him? Straight in front of you. Zoom in. That's it. Keep zooming. There he is. He's just to the left of that bush. There you are. You're on him. Can you see him? Yeah. There's the male Steinbock, everybody. An astonishing sighting of a stone buck who is uh, making like a stone, which is, of course, why he's called such. Somewhere around here will be his wife. Let me just sneak slightly forward. Oh, no, I thought we'd roll, but we can't. So his wife will be around here somewhere. And when I say wife, I do actually sort of mean it. Uh, his wife and he will make a monogamous pair. Whether or not they engaged in adultery, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that anyone's ever done a study on the adulterous nature or lack thereof in the Stirnbock. I do wonder, if you are born a Stirnbock, do you think that perhaps you are born and are resentful of the fact that you are not an elephant? and that you are a perfect-sized snack for a leopard, cheetah, a wild dog, a hyena, not so much a lion. Not only that, but that you uh, have the strategy of what 
I mean, it must be the most terrifying strategy. Your strategy is not to run away as fast as you can, but to just freeze and hope that whatever's coming past you doesn't smell or see you. They must have nerves of steel, the Stienbork. Very good. Well, I think that was a spectacular Stienbork sighting. I'm thoroughly satisfied with it, and I think that we shall continue now. Someone is talking to me. Sorry. Truly, you'll have to go again with that. I missed it. My radio was down. Linda Poli said something of significance to me, but I'm not sure what it was. Yes, Linda, a fairy tale creature is the Stienbok. For those of you who don't know, Linda Poli is a long time viewer, and indeed, I, I must mention her and give her a special shout out because. She named her hamster after me. She had a hamster called James Henry, which has uh, sadly shuffled off this mortal coil. But there it is. Not many of us can say we've had a hamster named after us, can we? No. We're going to go down to this water hole and hope that something other than a blacksmith lapwing is there. I have a feeling about this morning. You know, you just get a feeling, and my feeling is that uh, it's going to be a fairly quiet one, that we are going to have to find small things, birds, steenbok, diker, perhaps the odd insect if we can find it. Well, we've already done termites, so we've done insects. But that's okay. I do wish to point a camera at a leopard at some stage, but we have some time. Now let us go down to the Eastern Cape. Oh, hang on, let's not do it just yet. Slowly, Olof, there's a warthog in this burrow. Sorry, Kulu, I'm just going to show you this wart pig that thought it was going to go unnoticed. See? See the wart pig lying amongst the Chlorus Roxbergiana? He's just coming out of his burrow. Just observing the morning brightening around him before he goes out for breakfast. He looks like he may have a hangover. Perhaps he was out at the pub last night and had one too many or three or four too many. It is Saturday morning, after all, and uh, therefore perhaps it was a heavy Friday night at the <laughs> Rhizome and Rumble, which is the very famous warthog pub uh, hereabouts. Either that or he's dead and been dragged in there by a hyena, and in fact... All we can see is his front half sticking out the front of the mound while he's being consumed. But I don't think that is the case. Good morning. Hello. Are you alive? Could you show us some sign of life? Frickin' ear. Blink. There we go. He gave us a little blink. He is alive. Did you have a heavy night last night? Hmm? Drink too much? Huh? Go out with the boys. Feel a bit of peer pressure, did you? Hmm? Yes. You'll find as you get older, you, your body won't cope with the booze the same way that it did when you were young. Yes, I can see that you're starting to experience that now. Hmm. I myself have to be very careful of it. Don't worry, you'll feel better in probably a few hours, maybe tomorrow. I'd suggest a, a fry-up, strong cup of coffee, 
And I mean, if you're feeling really brave, a bloody Mary. Hmm? No? Gosh, you are a very entertaining fellow. Good. OK. Well, I suppose we shall probably now head down to the Eastern Cape, to where Nicholas is standing, somewhere between the Karicha and Bushman's Rivers, at Karicha Game Reserve. And there, I am sure he will show you some of the interesting things that occur in that part of the country. We've got an exceptionally misty morning here at Karika this morning. But lovely, beautiful, sort of scenic shots that we've got here. Just to introduce myself, I'm Nick. I'm going to be your photographic naturalist for today. And it's been absolutely incredible. I mean, the mist we literally haven't even been able to, to see through for the last 20 minutes or so. It's finally just starting to clear a little bit. You can see we've got one or two zebra making their way across here. This is literally the first time that we can, can actually see anything. But I'm sure today is going to be an absolute steamer of a day. Remember often in the mornings low down in these valleys and things like this if you do find some mist like this there's a good chance it's going to really heat up. So it'll be interesting to see how the how the day develops. I've kind of positioned myself a little bit lower down closer to Scotia Dam here. So the sun uh, is further to the east of me and I was really hoping that it would uh, it would kind of pop through all of this mist and um, and bring a bit of color to it. We didn't quite get there but this is a stunning view though. You can just see the the reflection a little bit of the zebra walking in the water there or walking on the land and reflecting on the water rather. See that young little foal is quite the, the mist is starting to clear. Looks like we've got a wildebeest bull in the background. Oh, patches of sunlight and mist. It just, it's such a emotive and moody sound. And I think in conditions like this that we've got, you've kind of, you've got to take what you can get. You know, we we had a, a silhouette shot or something with the sun trying to break through a little bit of that mist. Didn't quite get that, but you know, there's these small patches behind me. It's still completely enveloped in mist. Uh, we've just got the small sort of 70 degree sort of arch going across here of where it's it's opened up a little bit. When was the last time you caught your breath? When were you last truly amazed? 
when last did you marvel at the wonder of nature? Wild Earth Epic Animal Encounters Only available on the Wild Earth app. It is so nice, it's so great to see these saddlebull storks again. Absolutely love these birds. I think they are so beautiful. That beautiful red beak with a little black kind of uh, band around it. And of course that yellow saddle that sits right on top of the beak itself. Hence the name saddlebull stork. And this is the male. As you can see at the bottom of his beak, there's like a little uh, yellow wattle and black eyes. What? It's going to almost caught the fish. You can see the fish swimming around around him there at the moment and he's playing a very much of a patient game here so he's just waiting for that opportunity to see if he can catch one of these tilapias and you can just see how, how deep he is that's why pretty much very tall birds looking at about 150 centimeters tall so and his legs is completely submerged in the water and so like pretty much in the middle of the dam. Oh, and there's so many fish around here. It's amazing. It looks like he's playing a different uh, game or hunting technique compared to his uh, partner, the female. Oh, almost. The female's moving along the water edge at the moment and she's doing more of the wading kind of uh, hunting skill where he's just doing the very patient game side of things where he's just waiting slowly to see if he's going to be lucky enough to catch something. Ryan, Brian, I'm not too sure, sorry, Tulu, just go with the name again. Oh, pine. Uh, yes, pine, they do catch any kind of fish. I mean, they will catch uh, catfish, tilapia, bream, so all the different, uh, a lot of uh, different species of uh, fish that's inside of this water or in the dams in the rivers um, little yellow fish as well so yes anything any kind of fish 
and it's but of course they won't go catch something too big that they cannot swallow so they'll make sure it's just big enough for them to grab it and chuck it down their throat well, the females just coming past so the, just so you'll, so you'll find the female will be approaching the male very shortly so we're just going to stick to stick to this male at the moment as I say, the females just at a bad position where the sun is reflecting off the off the water I'm not going to see too much but sure, I haven't seen saddleball stalks for a couple of months now so it's nice to see a pair that's here at Biffleswick Dam Okay, so the female is going to be coming closer to the male now, so you'll see the female's got this typical yellow eye where the male's got the black eye. Almost like a female's got the, how can I say, like makeup around her eye. And she comes through. And big birds, I mean, they're weighing about six, seven kilograms. So, I mean, that's for a bird that is quite heavy. <laughs> yeah, Kathy Lee, I think so. I think the male is becoming a little bit picky. Uh, I think he's definitely looking for the bigger fish. And uh, the female is doing more the walking around on the edges for the smaller little ones. But, but I think he's playing more the patient game compared to her. I think she's the one that's really uh, out to look for as many fish as possible where he's just uh, waiting for maybe one substantial catch here. Yeah. <laughs> and there's so many fish I mean it's like actually you'll see them all the little uh, ripples happening around them so when they do move around all of a sudden the fish all kind of uh, I can say move away from them and you can see they create these little ripples around them and he's still just standing there <laughs> very strange I mean like uh, with the male and female yeah, as I said two different uh, fishing te uh, technique he's like he's pulling more the typical heron uh, way of fishing because the herons are usually the ones that will stay at one spot and they'll wait for the opportunity to strike very quickly and uh, you'll find your storks are the waders the storks are kind of just moving through and uh, you know just disturbing the water a little bit and the sediment to see if they get get a reaction out of the fish or frogs um, but yeah definitely this male is pulling a, a heron a sort of hunt Yes, Gordon, definitely. Those beaks are absolutely so beautiful and so long. So really much built for poking into the water as deep as possible. And the same as their legs, very long, long legs. So it's all really built for wading through these uh, dams and marshy areas and rivers and uh, trying to look for any fish that's not just on the edge, but also practically, as you can see, this male standing almost in the middle of the dam so uh, they are really built perfectly for these kind of uh, situations I 
You can see that female is still busy. I said, just she's just gone back to the other side of the dam, still trying to shop as much as possible for as many little fish as she can get a beak on. She's definitely looking for as many things as possible that side. But yeah, this male is playing a good old game. Yeah, this is fantastic. I just love watching them. And I mean, as I say, such a beautiful bird. Don't get to see them too often. I was just like trying to listen out there. It just sounds like maybe towards Biffles cut line, Cheetah cut line side. There was a lot of a lot of noises that was coming from that side. I'm not too sure what. It sounded maybe like buffalo. But I'll go and investigate shortly. This is, you'll see just to the one side of where the saddleable stalk is, we do have, the, of course, the heron, the grey heron. So he's also just uh, waiting for his little moment to catch something. Of course, he's doing typical of the, the, the heron way of hunting, so standing still and waiting for that fish to come past. Now we are looking at a black crowned chagra, which is very special. Not because it's uncommon, but because it is uncommon that it will sit still for long enough to be on camera. The black crowned chagra. It has a lovely lilting call, which sounds a little bit like this. that sound plaintive? I think it is quite a plaintive call. It is called a black crowned chagra because it has. Very good everybody, the black crown. We also have something called a brown crowned chagra which has a... yes! Gosh you've got two out of two. A brown crown. And it is a member of the Schreik family. It has that tooth on the end of its beak that distinguishes it as a shrike. You might be able to hear in the background the chin spot batisse. Some rattling cesticulars going. Pss, 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 pss. And the black 
crowned Chagra has now absconded. Lawrence, I don't know how many bird calls I can uh, imitate. Not very many. The whistling ones I can do. But um, something like a, a grey heron, for example, uh, much more difficult. They sort of make a loud squawk. Um, I can do. I can't really do Franklins either. I have a generic Franklin call, which I probably won't do for you now, uh, because it'll it'll wake you up rather too suddenly. Um, I am minded, of course, of the time that. You remember way back in history when we had these things called compact discs. Do you remember them? CDs? Uh, I mean, I know it wasn't that long ago, but uh, we used to have bird calls on CDs. And unlike on these apps where you can just find the bird you want and play its call, the CDs didn't have a single track per bird, so you had to scroll through a whole lot of bird calls before you got the bird that you wanted. And uh, you'd have somebody narrating it for you, so you'd have... Number 365, Chin Spot Battis, and then they'd play the bird. <laughs> and I'll never forget the, <laughs> the Swainson's Franklin, and the way the guy narrated it, he was so bland, so horribly bland. And it went something like, Number 374, Swainson's Spurfowl. <laughs> And the reaction that I used to have to that CD is exactly the one you've just had, which is to leap out of your skin, uh, probably fall on the floor, and if you had a pet that was watching the show, I've no doubt they too have now leapt from their skin and are looking at the screen, swearing. <laughs> but that Franklin noise could be a chicken, it could really be anything. The one that I make, not the actual one that the Swainson Spurfile makes. We always used to think it was very funny when we were training to be guides. Way back, the dim mists of history when compact discs were the thing. Ladybug Sarah, you say you missed my bird whistles. Well, I'm glad to return them to your ears, Ladybug Sarah. Our quest for the young male leopard Maripsi, or rocks, has been unsuccessful. So I think we're probably going to head out of this western sector of the reserve and uh, move down towards the central regions and see what we can find. Still, it's very pleasant driving around in the summer vegetation. There's lots of nice greenery, lots of, lots of nice birdsong, flowers, fruits coming from some of the trees. And it's just very nice to be out in the wild, as opposed to in a city. We're back at the termite mound that we originally did, so we've done sort of enormous and um, convoluted figure of eight to get back to where we are now. This is a particularly attractive little grove, if you like, especially at this time of the year. It is a grove of silver cluster leaf trees, or uh, Terminalia sericeas, and I've always really liked it because it's open underneath and it's really lovely parkland. All right, let's go across to Cedars. I think Cedars is probably also towards the central parts of Juma. Let's find out what he has there. All right, thanks, James. Yes, I'm on the Cheddar Cut line at the moment. We've got elephants in front of us. So um, I think this is what I heard earlier, is uh, these early elephants that were playing around maybe. Um, but yes, as well for those leopard tracks that I had this morning, it seemed like they did cross back into Biffleshook, so well, uh, that female leopard. I didn't have the leopard itself, it's just the tracks. So yeah, fortunately, it looked like maybe during the night or earlier this morning. I tell you, we've got a nice herd of elephants here. 
It's just moving down. Hey, Lou. The youngsters. Okay, let's see if I can freewheel down here. Am I going to get it right? Yeah, let's turn the, let's turn Sparky off, and let's freewheel. It's always nice. Sometimes it's nice just to cut the engine noise out, especially with the elephants. I'm gonna get over this little bump here. There we go. Hello, little ones. Okay. So we've got like a little herd here, not big, a smallish herd. Oh, there's more in the background. Oh, they're going into torture. They're not too relaxed. That's not too good. So, what do you think, um, Paul? Try and stop here just after this termite mound. Let's see. Uh, uh, the sun is terrible, but yeah, they're not very relaxed. Oh, they are running. They are definitely very agitated, so I'm not gonna. You can see a lot of the dust that's coming up there now. The entire herd has just bolted in the easterly direction, so I'm not too sure what got to them. Maybe another male that was around that was just pestering the the herd itself. But yeah, I'm gonna continue. All right, let's continue. Let's continue with our, with our bumble. Yeah, they've gone. All right, so I think what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to go down on Central, going to go back into Juma, and just to take a look if uh, we are lucky that side, maybe towards uh, Niola South. Um, and try and follow up on maybe. Uh, that's from Marips. I know that uh, James had uh, that young male leopard's tracks going south, so I'm also going to just try and hit that area. We don't know how far he's moved during the night. Oh, there's a lot of, a lot of tracks here, hyena tracks. But yes, the sun has decided to... Oh, there's a nice elephant there. Busy feeding on some uh, rulers. Hey, my boy. Always a nice time of the year with uh, the marulas and uh, the marula trees busy for bearing the fruits. And of course, uh, the elephants are loving it. As you know, it's like almost like pudding to them. So they all tend to move from one marula tree to the next one to eat as many marulas as possible. M6, yes, definitely they are. It's, uh, they're so nice to watch, and especially as I say, it's nice to see so many elephants now on the property. Once, oh, sorry, I just hit my elbow against this little black box here um, on the property, and it's nice just to see what's happening and and how they actually how they pick up on these uh, these trees, and they know exactly which tree to go to and which trees are bearing the most fruit around here. So yes, sorry, there is another vehicle that's just coming here, so. I'm just going to quickly wait and see what they're going to do here. Oh, it looks like they're moving off. And elephants can eat around about 70 to 80 marulas just at a sitting, just at like one tree. So there's like about 70, 80 marulas lying on the ground. They will pick all those marulas up and eat, eat them. And if they want more, they will actually sometimes even shake the marula tree. And of course, all the little marulas will start like kind of tumbling down, raining down onto the ground. And they'll continue eating as many as possible. You can see he flicks it into his mouth, just like M&M's. Flick them in. Yes, definitely a beautiful, beautiful morning. A little bit, a little bit of cloud cover, but yes, definitely it's starting to heat up nicely now. But yeah, well, I'm going to continue going in uh, back into Juma side of things. Uh, let's head over to Nick at Karit to see what's happening down in the Eastern Cape.
and we've still got our lovely misty conditions here it's been quite difficult to <laughs> to try and, and line up a photographic opportunity you know the the movement of where the mist is obviously the animals are shifting around something like the tree that we've got in the background here is just adding an extra bit of depth to the shot and with the different sort of densities of the mist all around just now we did have all of these zebras in beautiful bright sunlight and then it was it was quite nice with that that darker sort of mist in the background let's just wait around and see if it does uh, does come back and give us a little bit of a show here but it's been a nice challenge to try and uh, line up a, a shot here to, to try and incorporate all of this mist and I must say of uh, of all of the days so far of uh, 2023 this is most definitely the mistiest day that we've had here and already I can feel that it is going to be hot 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 today um, so further behind me to the to the east it's now starting to break it's now starting to kind of move apart and the sun's really starting to burn off a lot of this mist so I really think it's a matter of time before it all sort of uh, evaporates things heat up and then I would imagine uh, the rivers and the water holes and things like that are going to be the places to be today. The zebra on the right just standing standing proud chest out stomach in there there are some blessed book further across just walking from a to b that's what i'm sure that she's been looking at there just assessing and it's been incredible when when this mist was sort of thickly set in everybody couldn't see well um, and i've kind of been maneuvering around this group of zebra quite a lot and then there was an impala I couldn't even tell you where it was but one impala that alarm called and it was so interesting to watch the immediate ripple effect through through the herd you know usually in, an, in a sort of open clearing like like this where we are by Scotia Dam everybody can see quite far around and if, if, if there is an alarm call they can kind of have a good look for themselves but with this thick mist that set in nobody could see what was happening and um, <laughs> shame it just sent fear through the whole dazzle. Thank you for joining us and have a fantastic Did you miss all <laughs> Never fear? You won't have to miss another beat on Wild Earth again with our Catch Ups channel, where you can rewatch missed safaris and shows whenever you please. Only available on the Wild Earth app. Thank you for joining us and have a fantastic morning.
a long-tailed shrike, or magpie shrike, sorry, sits at the top of a quarry bush, surveying the land and thinking about breakfast. Should I have a grasshopper? And now he has gone. Here's his friend. He's come up to the top there. There he is. And in the background you did hear the Swainson's spur fowl. Squawk, squawk, squawking away. But of mammal life I can find a little sign. We will keep searching, however, through this pleasant morning. And we'll enjoy the birds. And whatever else comes our way. Now I shall smile at you. There's an insect here. Now, if you have just joined us, just stumbled over this channel, you are watching a live safari from the western fringes of the Great Kruger National Park currently. And we're also coming to you from the Eastern Cape in the northwest. And it's lovely to be out here on a live safari. And you see this animal here, Olaf. My name is James Hendry, by the way, in case anyone's wondering. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Any questions or comments you might have would be great. Can you see that thing? I don't know what it is. Let me see if I can bring it towards you. I think that this is a spider. You see it there? That is masquerading as something other than a spider. Perhaps it will kill me. It is a spider, for it has got silk. Now, I think that the spider... Come on. Don't be an idiot. Get it on my hand. <laughs> you can't see anything here, can you? Um, I think that the spider is disguised as uh, something else. And you find these things, spiders often disguise themselves as things like ants. And they infiltrate ant nests and colonies and then eat the ants. Anyway, I think that's what's going on there. So it was a spider. I don't think you got a very good view of it. I think mark out of 10 for that particular sighting, one and a half probably, so not very strong. Anyway, we're going to continue now down towards the south. There's a water hole there. The heat is starting to build. Perhaps something thirsty will come and have a drink. That is our plan. Rather than just sitting with us on the vehicle, we're going to head across to Rexon Ntimane, who is sitting about 50 kilometers as the crow flies towards the west, just near the lamentable settlement of Hutzbreit. Thanks from James. We are here at Impala Plains. We are lucky now. All the impala are coming slowly into the tree lines that indicate it's very hot here in the course of a morning. It looks like uh, all of them they might spend the rest of the day underneath this uh, the thicket of tambutis. It's really, really getting hot here. We are looking around here. This is the area where we see quite a lot of pixie pan female and the cubs. It's been recorded, uh, I mean, three, four days they were moving in and out in the area i believe that uh, might be still in the surrounding and we move into the area this is the area where last night the three uh, dogs they have crossed into the uh, north mainly they might come back in the area this area it's very really rich with impala they call it impala clearing 
most of the time wild dogs lions like the most to come here the raising of the wild dogs this area has been cleared you can see there's nothing that can really stop the wild dog hunting here there's no much uh, trees and the rocks on the way if they really chase something they can be so much successful I believe even cheetah would love the area if they come in the surrounding more especially because of these activities of Impala such amazing Right, look like the impala coming from all direction. You can see some of them coming to the north. It looked like in the course of a day when it's too hot, these impala look they utilize this area a lot and slowly we're sure heading straight towards the HQ water hole is where most of the time they can really get water. All these uh, dams that are here, uh, leopard dams dry, so all the animals coming here. If we concentrate more in the area here where the water source, I believe, is where we might get to see more predators in the course of uh, late afternoon or early part of the morning. Once at the stage coming down here, there was a bachelor boys I had showing concern into the drainage land, but eventually they relaxed. Lauren asking what is an impala rat. An impala rat is when the impala are ready for season, when they are ready time for mating. We had them making that uh, loud noise that is the ratting season and they're making that ratting because uh, really they are after the females. The males will be really organizing themselves, pushing one another, fighting to make sure that uh, the one that is dominating the rest is the one that will wait for a male that uh, is always with the female to lose energy then they can uh, go and take over and mate it's very interesting i mean lauren to to see the writing season or explain how to break down the word writing season a writing season is when the <clears throat> mainly yes is the mating season of the impala it's such a beautiful thing to see they all fight as a result most of the time lions and leopards during that fight of or during the ratting season they don't really go far they wait where the bachelor boys and go and wait there because they keep on fighting concentrating on fighting it's easy for lions and leopards to make a kill on the impala during that ratting season it's the mating season actually that uh, competes with the males a lot I really say that no woman no cry that is more the correct word because because the women and mating this fight takes practically a lot who have a right to mate because of survival of the fetus if not fit out in nature you're not going to mate you know that impala males kudu or even buffalo anything out in nature Whoever have a right to mate is the strongest one. If you're not strong enough, you're not going to. That is all about uh, the writing season. It will happen soon. It's only end of February, March. You will witness quite a lot of writing season. They have that kind of uh, culture, the impala, where you see them chasing one another. The tail will be white, fluffy, and they're making deep voice that you might think it's T-Rex that making that uh, noise because uh, it's really deep and uh, so intimidating the noise that comes out you won't believe that it comes from these medium-sized antelope of impala you might think it's something that's huge especially at night you see that uh, within this uh, impala here yeah, there's a male there uh, that he, he wins the fight from uh, writing season maybe during mating last year and he's still keeping with the female but if his condition drops he's going to be challenged a lot when it comes to writing season he's the one that is mating you see he's all the time chasing the female behind Healthy looking male. 
I won't doubt he is really in the rank. It's now his time to really do so, to take care of the female, trying to check if females, one of the females is in the estrus, but it's not the right, right time now. It will be end of uh, February, around March. If it happens that the mate now is something that will be not even recorded in the book, is something that uh, we will learn from uh, today onwards because I can see is more behind the female trying to check using the Jacobson organ if the female is in oysters or not but hardly most of them they will be in oysters end of the the February around March mid March there will be lots of uh, challenging males will come here and wait on the outskirts of the breeding herd of the impala The impala now single fire as you can see they are moving out of the area they may be heading towards a queue slowly but sure and able to get there safe they have to be on that single fire wind is to peak here is a very good uh, moment of course if the cats are in the area to make the movement slowly towards the impala I wish for the wild dogs to come and hunt here. It will be nice. But the only thing with the cats during the hot day, early part of the morning, most of them, they lie down. So we're still in the same position as we were before, but as you can see, the, the mist is now finally cleared completely. And I'll tell you what, the humidity and the temperature are already starting to go through the roof. So we're looking back here towards Scotia Dam, and you can already see we've got quite a bit of activity going on. Got some impalas there, Got uh, one or two Egyptian goose. That uh, that dazzle of zebra that we had earlier, kind of starting to make its way down towards the outskirts of the water itself. And I would say that um, all of the water holes in the whole reserve are going to be an absolute hot spot today. So I think. We're more than likely going to focus a lot of our attention on the water holes. Remember with the, the mud wallow surrounding Scotia Dam being dried up now, there is the, 
the very good chance that if the rhino do come down to have a little uh, sort of mud wallow, they'll have to go and plant themselves in the in the waters of Scotia Dam here itself. So that'll be amazing if we manage to see that. And it'll be interesting to see with uh, with the massive increase in temperature that we've got today, and even over the the past few days, maybe by yesterday, um, it's been really hot. So it'll be quite interesting to see if if we see a lot of activity from things like snakes. I'll definitely do uh, a little bit of driving along the banks of the the Karicha River. Um, just have a look and see if we don't uh, potentially get lucky with that. See if we can find any reptiles. But I can hear far across on the other side of uh, sort of the edge of the open clearing there are a pair of Egyptian goose shouting down there and obviously in the center of the frame on our little island here. We can see we've got another pair of Egyptian geese that are sitting right on the top. And I'm just waiting for the the flurry of wings and the shouting to each other to start. Remember they're quite almost like territorial of, of the area, quite vocal to each other. Lindy, thanks for your question. Um, I think in terms of seeing snakes, it's... Uh, you know, you, you really almost has to be like a right place at the right time in order to see one. Um, I have seen a few, uh, mostly boom slungs that I've seen. Um, but you've got to remember that as a kind of a general rule of thumb, that snakes are quite nervous and, and don't really want interaction with people. So most of the time when you do see snakes, it's kind of quite a, a fleeting glimpse. But uh, with these hotter temperatures, that'll definitely start to draw the snakes out. Remember, they're not able to regulate their body temperatures. So, um, you know, conditions like this, we should really start to see a lot of snakes coming out. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a massive fan of touching snakes or anything like that, but I'm quite happy to have a look at them. They're quite intriguing. I did see a video one of my one of my friends took up on the the north coast of a massive forest cobra um, it's obviously north coast as well humidity levels are quite high there lots of heat drawing the snakes out and he, he saw this he, he got a video of the thing one of the biggest forest cobras I think I've ever seen remember they've got that beautiful sort of uh, yellowish color one or two sort of black speckles but largely yellowish in color just a single nyala bull drinking there at the edge of the water most of our impalas have kind of moved off to the side down here and you can see the whole time how the lighting conditions keep changing um, there's still a little bit of mist behind me um, a little bit of cloud cover and you can see how the the sun keeps shifting around so in terms of your um, you know your lighting for photos you've got to bear in mind exactly when you when you would be taking your picture here something's definitely upset our baboons this morning for the past 15 20 minutes or so they've been shouting and they're still going on quite far down uh, in the sort of the gorge running north from Scotia Dam here you know if it's kind of like a domestic quarrel amongst the troop you often hear the the little youngsters getting involved and you hear their high-pitched little shout but uh, it just seems like the, 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 the dominant male that's calling. Maybe I'll head down in that area and investigate, see if there's anything there. 
think in the meantime, let's take you across to James and see what he's got. Now, we have found a lioness. I say we, I'm taking credit for finding this lioness. I didn't find her. In fact, I was looking entirely the other direction when Olaf said, ah, oh, there's a lioness, and there she is. And I'm pretty sure that this is the injured lioness that Cedric and Olaf had yesterday. And we're now on Chitwa Chitwa, which is the reserve to the west, uh, at least east and south of Juma. And so she's come about, as the crow flies, maybe a mile, one and a half kilometers or so. And here she is lying, just resting up. She lifted her head briefly to look at us and is now no longer interested in seeing what we have to offer her. Now, if you have just joined us or you're confused about what's going on here with the lions, you're not alone. I feel quite confused myself because the lion dynamics here are very fluid currently. On the account, or on account of the fact that a new coalition of male lions called the Black Dam males has come in here. They sound like pirates. And they have now occupied a territory that has been left vacant by the demise of the Avoca coalition. And they arrived here and took this territory without so much as a shot fired because it was vacated by the Birmingham boys before that. So I suppose not particularly surprising that they should leave it without too much of a whimper. Now, while this lioness is injured, it should be noted that she is still a lioness and therefore capable of wreaking tremendous physical trauma on anything that might come past her. And I've seen an impala and now two nyalas coming down through this woodland to the left of her. And I wonder if they won't step upon her by mistake and in so doing make a catastrophic error of judgment. She's pretty well hidden if you are not sitting this far above her. So that's how Olaf the Viking managed to see her. We're a long way up above her. But if you were coming down through this thick woodland that are on the other side of this damn wall, she'll be almost impossible to see. So I think she is a member of the very famous Nkuhuma pride. And I'm going to have to reacquaint myself with all of these lions because it is very difficult to tell who's who in the proverbial zoo. Now, although she's injured, and I don't know where she's injured. Olaf, where is she injured? She's Back just right she's limping. Yeah. Back right leg, says Olaf. Uh, you know, she actually looks pretty well fed to me. She doesn't look like she's about to drop dead of starvation. And although I think it is nice of us to feel a little bit sorry for her, given that she is going through a traumatic period, I don't think we need to be too worried. Unbelievably resilient, these animals. Mark, I have no idea when she's likely to be active again. There, she's looking around. I suppose that must constitute some form of activity. But I think that she will become more active if she gets very hungry and therefore has to find something to eat. I think she may become quite uh, thirsty during the course of this hot day and come and have a bit of a drink here. And I think perhaps she also might get active if she hears uh, some other lions calling. Now she's looking towards where those Nyala were coming from. And now her head is back down. I can unfortunately see somebody with a weed-eating uh, piece of machinery in Chitwa Lodge, which is not far from where we are. So if you do hear the sound of uh, a weed eater, you'll know why. I'm just warning you. So we're very, there we go. We're very close to Chitwa Lodge. 
And on cue, he is fired up. What he's doing, in case you were wondering, you probably weren't, but in case you were, he's just clearing the grass below the electric fence. How oh, lovely. What a gorgeous wilderness sound being created here. <laughs> has to be done, and has to be done when the guests are not in camp. That's why it's being done now. Okay, I think we're going to leave this lioness. I think it's highly unlikely she's going to do anything at all. And so while the weed eater does its job, you're going to head somewhere else. Here at Wild Earth, we know it's not always possible to watch your favorite show live. If catching up on safaris is critical to you, then download the Wild Earth app and watch the catch-ups here first. Catch-ups are available on our app before YouTube, and in addition, there are cut-downs of each show for those who only have time to watch the best bits. <laughs> That's incredibly cute. Download the brand new Wild Earth app today and don't miss out. I can't see the other partner around here, so it's usually they are usually um, monogamous, so it's usually partners for life, but yeah, I don't see that one. The Zola, no, they're not so related to a snake eagle, that's a thing, that's why when that whole thing, oh, look at, oh, look at that, absolutely spreading, oh, that is beautiful, like, oh, <laughs> wow. That is just stunning. See how it spread its wings like that now. Now I'm, I'm sure it's just yeah, warming up those feathers and warming up its body now. Maybe going to be taking flight very shortly, that's why. But that is amazing. But yeah, a lot of people are saying like a short-tailed snake eagle, but um, I want you to go and look that up. There is absolutely no information about a batelier being called a short-tailed snake eagle. Unless I completely missed it somewhere, but I looked and the only thing is a short-toed snake eagle. And I think that's what, that uh, short-toed snake eagle you actually get in the, in the US, so North America, not here in Africa. So, and uh, no, and the batelier, I mean the batelier is more of a scavenger where you'll find the snake eagle, the brown snake eagle or the black uh, chested snake eagle, they catch live uh, prey. So they catch snakes or uh, reptiles, 
you know, chameleons or anything like that. But your batalia is a scavenger, just like the vulture, um, like the tawny eagle. They'll go and look for something that's dead somewhere and they'll feed on that. So yeah, it's got no relations to a snake eagle. Oh, that was fantastic, eh? It's just spread. It's just amazing how big those wings are. I think their wings stretch. I think it's 1.7, 1.8, 1.7 meters. And stretches out. I mean, it's built perfectly for soaring. And for these uh, birds of prey, I mean, they can, they can take when they take flight and soaring around, they can. So for about almost two to three hours without even flapping its wings. So it's built perfectly for that. Just like a kite. And catching the thermals and of course and moving around. Yeah, the light is getting very difficult here now. You're right there, Paul. It's fine. You're right there. But they have been sitting in that nest. I saw not long ago, uh, yeah, on Ingwe Alley. It's just a road that's just north of us. And um, there is a nest there. So it seems like they were sitting, or one of them was sitting on the nest the other day. So I wonder if they're not nesting again. All right, so <clears throat> I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to continue. I'm going to try and head over towards Gary Dam and see what's happening that side. But while I do that, let's head over to James to see what's happening on his safari. I'm currently going to have a little bit of breakfast. I'm going to have a marula or two. Now, I don't know if you've had this explained to you, but there are certain criteria that a marula must fulfill in order for it to be something delicious to eat. It should be yellow, it should be soft, and it should be undamaged. Olaf, have you had a marula? Did you enjoy it? Yes. Yes, he did enjoy it. Good. This is a perfectly ripe marula. It is yellow, not too soft, so that it has become um, dry inside. And it is uh, exactly the right size. So now, I'm, you may have had this explained to you, but I shall just explain it again. What you do with these things is you take off a bit of the skin Mm. savouring the first hit of the juice on your tongue and then you squeeze the fruit into your mouth. Mm. Not wasting any of the juice that might be left in the skin. And suddenly all is right with the world. It's a delicious taste that really is impossible to describe. It tastes like marula. Sweet and fruity and nothing like a marula cream, the liqueur. Then, I just need to retrieve my telephonic device, not because I want to make a phone call, but because I found another flower that I've forgotten. Mmm. Trace, you're absolutely right. A lovely breakfast snack from nature. Can you see this one here, Olof? Right, so here's a purple flower, the name of which I do not know, and I'm going to look it up. Or I'm going to hope that Judy H tells me what it is. Just keep focused on it, if you don't mind, so that we can have a good look. But 
but otherwise I must say everything is pretty quiet in these parts still it doesn't make it any less beautiful right let's move on from here Mmm. Delicious snack. So we left that lioness, obviously, because she was just sleeping quietly and not doing anything of particular note. And we'll see what else we can find. We're approaching the Chitwa Chitwa airstrip. So in case you thought this was perhaps a desert or some sort of a barren natural phenomenon, it is not. We are on an airstrip. After my snack, we're going to head across to Rexon at Pridelands, 50 or so kilometers that way, and see what he can find. Thanks, joining us. We are here at Prideland Live. We're heading towards the uh, Leopard Dam. And let's see what might be the Leopard Dam holds for us. It looked like uh, there was uh, tracks here uh, for a breeding herd of elephant. Maybe they might be still in the area or not. I love this area. I've seen quite a lot of Ngati Pride in and out. But there's no evidence from the boundary we have checked with the Jana Cut line. Nothing much, but let's see. You never know, it might uh, something going down to a leopard dam. As animal used to that water source, I believe there might be still. Look at that, there's impala there running. It looks like there's a wild dogs here. Let me quickly go in. I saw the impala running from this side, going more, mainly towards the East. Let me get there in time. You know, when the impala see wild dogs, the prompting that they do, I've seen quite a few of them doing the same behavior. It could be uh, something that they like to do it because the happy you got because of the weather or because of healthness, but I don't see any sign of uh, them to be celebrating now. But you never know, wild animals can. Let's see, let's uh, take this opportunity over to James and see what you find. Now, the other day, Cedric was talking about the fact that he had not seen a European roller. And I remember a few years where we didn't see them here and we just found two. And I saw one yesterday on the way in, and now there are two having a fight. Just around these marula trees. I'm just going to go a bit forward so we can get them in picture. Hmm, one of them is a lilac-breasted. I wonder if they haven't chased off the European one. Okay, so there's a lilac-breasted flying over the top of us. There that one is. And there's another one there dash. So the European, oh, there's the European. European, mm, is it? Yes, they've just landed next to each other. Have they? I think that's the European up top there. Can you see them there? I can. Let me go forward a bit. Now, for those of you who don't know, a European roller is a relatively common migrant to this part of the world, especially at this time of the year. And it's a slightly less fancied, more subtle version of its lilac-breasted relative there. Top of that tree there. You got it? 
No, that's the hornbill that's flying off. The European roller is still up there. Except it's calling. I wonder if it isn't just a juvenile. It might just be a juvenile lilac breasted. Can you see it there, Olaf? No, I can't. It's dead straight in front of us in that tree there. At the top. Uh, yeah, pretty much at the top. Um, Kulu, you'll have to help us to see if we've got it in picture there because I'm afraid the monitor I've got is impossible to discern. It's top in the middle, right at the top in the middle. I'm just going to find it on my app, what a juvenile looks like. You can't see it at the moment, okay? It's a bit of a disaster, stand by. Right, you got it, you got it. Good, good news. Juvenile, like, like adult, but duller, with brownish wash on the crown and nape. Tail stream is absent. Now that's the European roller, I'm pretty sure. Now what's interesting is that they are normally completely silent in this part of the world, because they don't breed here. But it seems to have absconded now. Okay, I'm going to go with European roller. They're slightly bigger than the lilac breasted. And we haven't seen one, so, you know, we want to see one. Right, for those of you who didn't see it, here in my book, my bird guide, I have got some for you. The rollers we have seen in this part of the world are the broad-billed roller, we saw one here once, the lilac-breasted, and the European. You can see he doesn't have the lilac breast. Oh, we also see the purple, of course, or rufous-crowned. Gorgeous. Gorgeous birds. Right, I think we shall press on now. Good. I'm sure you're all excited. I'm sure you're all sort of bouncing about, leaping over your homes and shouting and wassailing over the excitement of seeing a European roller. Probably time for me to spit my pip out. I hope an aeroplane doesn't hit it. Yes, so we are here yeah, just at one of the marula trees and look at this whole herd of elephants coming down for some marulas. But look at the little baby as well. Let's see a small one. This is so, so precious. Hey girl, yes we are just watching you. We're just enjoying your morning walks. So they're going from one marula tree to the next one but coming right past me. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Yes, so you're so enjoying those marulas. And showing your whole family these beautiful fruits. Oh, that's it. Hitting all the dust off. That is so cute. This is absolutely amazing. Wow. And there's so many of them. So I'm not going to move too much and talk too loud because they're right next to me. And there's a, such a small baby as well, a little calf. And oh, there's a big male that's in must that's approaching as well. All right, well, that's that. Mm, okay. I'm just watching this male in must at the back. Okay, um, Paul, let's keep an eye on that one. I'm hoping he's not going to cause too much problems here. So I'm just going to get myself always ready, especially if there's a big boy at the back end. You can see just his head up there. Turn my vehicle on, just always be prepared. 
I'm making sure it's on in reverse. So always think ahead of time. Here he comes. Is he? Uh, it, look, he's nah, he's not dribbling beyond his uh, his back legs. Nah, he's not wet. His his, his temporal glands is wet, but he's not dribbling any urine. So so he is not in must. So he's fine. Nah, he's fine. Almost what he was. But he's a big boy. This has been amazing. Looks like this big herd of elephants have just moved from one marula tree. They just polished off all the marulas that was on the ground. And looks like they're heading off to a next, a next tree. And there's a one big male there. And a couple of small calves as well. That's part of it. What do you think? Go around there or you get to find there? Let's go around, huh? Eh? Alright, let's go around. We're gonna go around to the next tree and see if we can get a nice shot of the that is Wow! That was amazing! Absolutely amazing. Sorry, we just got to see them all coming right past the vehicle, right up to the vehicle, and is, and all very relaxed, which is a good thing, especially when they've got little calves as well. You've got to just keep your eyes open and making sure that you're not putting any pressure on them. All right, so I'm just going to do a, a little bit of a wider berth around, so you can see the. I just want to see where they're going to go. So the next marula tree is that side. Maybe that one's got some fruits on, and I think they're going to head straight there. So let's. Uh, shoot around and have oh, oops. <laughs> a little stick that flew up there almost to, uh, to pause the eye out all right let's go yeah i always love these big open clearings with these marula uh, trees as i say and um, i'm always looking exactly okay it looks like they're going to this tree yeah all right there's a there's a female tree this side it's bearing fruit, so I think they're going to go all there. Let's try and get that side then. You right then, Paul? All right, let's turn. I'm just going to pop ourselves in the shady, shade area. All right. Take one, take one. Take one. So, um, poor, um, um, poor Julie, I can't uh, copy the name there. But uh, yeah, they, the little calves will stay with mom and nurse from the mom. It could be sometimes four years, four and a half years. So, yes. But look at that little one now. Oh, that, there is such a small, small calf that's coming past there. Look at that cute. Oh, how sweet is that? Can like move on? Oh, that is so sweet. <laughs> Did you get to run? Uh, that is fantastic. But yeah, no, this is definitely a beautiful herd. Absolutely beautiful. I think it was like about 20 of them. 20, 25 of them. There's more in front of us as well. Of course, these ones in front of us, has, uh, they've chosen the little tree here because there's some fruits. And a whole lot of little fruits around down the ground. And also, funny enough, at this time of the year when the marula trees are dropping those fruits, you'll find on the all of their temple, uh, uh, temple glands or temporal glands is leaking because of the excitement of getting to these fruits. Uh, I enjoy it so much. This is amazing. I love it. <laughs> I love, these youngsters are always 
These youngsters are always so so entertaining. Here's Waikisha, definitely. They are absolutely such a relaxed herd, this. Very, very relaxed herd. And uh, it's nice to see this. A good bit of games happening here in front of us as well. Looks like it's a female, looks like two males, not the oldest of males. I was mourning with two young males. Double check out. A little bit wet as well on the side here, you can see most probably they were at some water water source not too long ago. They had a bit of a splash there. Alright, looks like they're moving away. <laughs> they're getting excited for the next tree. It's like uh, getting excited for the next uh, watering hole. Alright, let's go around. <clears throat> see where the rest of the herd is, all that side. Okay, so what I'm going to try and do, oh, let's see if I can catch up to the rest there. There's quite a few of the trees. Okay, let's go. Let's go this side. Oh, 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 watch out! Watch out! Watch out! I don't want to go into this hole here. Waikisha, yes, it's a, definitely is a beautiful herd of elephants. This, this is amazing, absolutely amazing to see this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so stoked about this at the moment. Uh, I'm just going to stop just here. So definitely they are... Oh, looks like two females that's just had a little bit of an argument there. And it's like, don't, don't steal my marula. You can see the big one on the left hand side, a big male. So he's just following them. He's not in must at all. So of course there's no urine, there's no must smell. It's, uh, between his back legs it's, uh, there's no kind of uh, wet marks. So he's not in must at all. I think he sometimes just follow them just for a little bit because nothing can happen. He's, if he doesn't go into must he cannot copulate with a female that's not in heat. Or even if there's a female that's in heat, it's still not going to happen. I think he'll just follow them, have a little bit of company, and then he'll almost tend to one move away from the herd. But you can just see how much bigger he is compared to the females. They go. Whoop. Now, see, this male's causing a little bit of trouble around here. And that's exactly what the females don't like that. Uh, the females hate it when these males chase the youngsters around. <laughs> Look at the lawn. <laughs> He's trying to. Sorry. Sorry, I'm poor. So that little, the little calf doesn't know where to go. It's like, must I follow this big male? No, where's, where's, where's my mom? Maybe so much sugar in all in these marulas that gives them this kind of, uh, this energy. They're all like kind of hyped up at the moment.
Join us from the 23rd till the 27th of January for a week of back-to-school special safaris tailored specifically towards our future conservationists. Our naturalists will exclusively be taking questions from schools across the globe. Tune in for some entertaining animal education to ease you back into the school year because fostering the upcoming generations of conservationists matters. Lovely. Joining us here in a beautiful um, dam here, which is really the water are getting low. It's getting dry. In fact, we had uh, lots of impala that comes in here. We were waiting here to see the behavior of the impala, what they're going to behave. It looks like the impala are still coming. Some of them they have left already. But what surprised me, all these impala when they left here, they were pronking, jumping, being happy. I don't know what kind of a behavior is that celebrating the I mean, dry water hole or it could be just because today I see clouds building up it might be raining so there's no stress from the impala even there's no water they know that maybe in a few few hours maybe at night there will be raining in the area and they can able to have water around in the area they still two or three impala males that are coming and on our way here what make us to become Indian most interested to see we have lots of impala that have mud on their body almost to their back which they've dipped in here try to get water so we're interested to see if that kind of behavior is going to take place but it look like they realize the danger that uh, is not a good thing to do because if it's a lion It will be lovely to see. Thanks everybody that joined us. We have a wonderful opportunity to have you here. From myself, uh, Rexen, and uh, uh, Owen behind the camera, we wishing you a, a very great day. Of course, if really around in the area, if we might be able to see something good, and I believe in a different location, where they have seen, I mean, lions, but flight down elephants. We have quite see, see quite a lot of things in the morning that turn uh, different location that takes place. But especially uh, a lion that is lying down, such amazing, pretty head of elephant, and more, etc., etc. We are right here at Prideland um, Leopard Dam live here. 
were looking for impala that uh, might dip in, into the mud that is would be very nice to see all of that if you do have question please can you send us question comment anything that you'd like to chat about or see for a day uh, it will be lovely to have that comment to you if you want to see something please do so And let's take this opportunity from Leopard Dam here at Pride Land with Impala over to James and see what you have located. Yeah. Ah, hello everybody. Sorry, I lost my radio comms there for a little while. There is an elephant, pretty obvious, not so obvious, was the flower we looked at earlier, which inevitably and miraculously and wonderfully Judy H has identified for us as Ruelia cordata, no common name, Ruelia cordata. Thank you for that Judy H. Ruelia cordata. Ruelia cordata. Ruelia cordata. I need to say it 586,000 times. Otherwise I will simply forget it. And this young elephant bull, as you can see, uh, is uh, quite excited by life, if you know what I mean. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> and he's just dropped a dart, as they say. And as Cedric was saying, he's just wandering about beneath the marula trees, enjoying the marulas. I'm just adding the name to my photograph of that flower. Mike, you're wondering at what age elephants go into their first must. Well... Difficult to say. Uh, puberty sort of starts probably around 11 years old, 10 or 11. And they will experience apparently brief periods of must from around then. Uh, maybe as late as 15, but maybe as early as 11 or 12. And they'll be very brief though, uh, maybe a day. And then as they get older, those periods of must extend. And when they're about 25, they can last for a month or so and when they're really big old bulls the periods of must will last for up to three months so it's it's not a simple answer to give there I think if you want to liken it to human beings uh, when a young male human being hits puberty there's a, an influx of testosterone and other hormones same thing for an elephant and that causes certain responses in the body and by the time you're a sort of 25 year old man well those hormones and things are probably at their height uh, for elephants it's slightly later and in elephants they don't decline probably quite as fast as human beings do so I mean old elephant bulls will mate and produce offspring right up until they start to lose condition uh, on their way to death as it were. This one, rather like the one yesterday, feels that his bottom is his best angle. I disagree. I don't think that his bottom is particularly impressive. Elephants don't have nice round bottoms like zebras do or warthogs. They've got sort of flat bottoms. I'm sure you've all met people who have got flat bottoms and on people it seems to be slightly more appealing but on a, well, an animal I feel a nice round bottom is, uh, is what is required. Elephants are magnificent from the front, not so good from behind. That's your personal opinion before I get destroyed by the Twitterverse. This chap has an itchy ankle. Perhaps he too was set upon by mosquitoes yesterday evening. 
That is a joke. I don't think that mosquitoes would be able to derive any nutrition from the skin of an elephant. This guy's also quite rebellious. If you look at his right ear there, Olaf, uh, naturally he's now turned his ear, but he has a hole in it. He has had it pierced, obviously, uh, and his father has denied him permission to wear an earring in the house. And so he has to just kind of have this hole in his ear. He's got a few holes in his ears. And they're very close to the edge where the skin is the thinnest. But I think it's quite interesting that he's got those sort of perfect holes. I'm surprised that he doesn't have rips where those holes are. I can't actually imagine how he got them. Oh, now he's going to try and kill us, Olaf. No, don't worry, he's not. That was a joke. Ha ha ha. Off he goes. To the next tree to see if there's a fruit or two that he might like to eat. Yeah, he's picked up, can you see that? He's picked up a little fruit. He's putting it in his mouth, having a bit of a chew. Now I think also what we're seeing here is that classic young bull elephant behavior where they could move on, the rest of the herd is just drifted off towards the east, which is to the right hand side of your picture. And he's actually quite enjoying this interaction. He's a little bit bored of living in the herd. And now we are providing him with a certain amount of entertainment or distraction before he gets on with the serious but probably quite boring day that lies before him. And although he's got his back to us, he's paying close attention to us. Paying close attention to what we're doing. I'm sure he's listening to the sound of my voice. Wondering what on earth I'm talking about. And he now seems to be heading off on to Juma. That's nice. Please remain. We'd like you to stay on Juma. If you haven't watched these shows before, everybody, we are not able to cross some boundaries. They're human boundaries, but boundaries that, as you can see very plainly, the elephants are completely allowed to cross. So you can't really tell an elephant what it can and can't do. So they're legal boundaries, not physical ones. And we have to stay on Juma, or Cheetah Plains, which are the two concessions that we operate on. So to the right-hand side of your picture is a reserve called Torchwood, where we may not go, but the elephants and whatever else can go quite happily whenever they feel like it. Sorry, Kulu, I missed that. Kulu is directing the show, by the way, in case you're wondering who I'm talking to. Ah, we're going to go across to Cedars now. I suspect he's probably uh, somewhere near central, central Juma. Thanks, James. Yes, I'm just sitting out in Pilot Plains at the moment, and I just I thought I heard some uh, kudu or, uh, or it could be a niola as well. There was alarm calling. I just heard one or two barks around this area, so I've just stopped here and just trying to listen out once again to see if I can hear them or if they do make that alarm call again. But as you know, it is back to school, back to school for all the kids once again. And that uh, we'll, well, we are going to be hosting a back to school from the 23rd to the 27th of uh, January. And we are doing a back to school for the first hour of the sunset safari. And we are looking forward to hosting all the schools that are taking part and cannot wait to hear all of the questions that all the little kiddies around the world have for us. So we will see you then. That's from the 23rd until the 27th of January. Back to school. Always nice to hear the questions from the kids from the school and hopefully we can answer as many, many questions on those days. But yeah, I don't hear anything else here in Paul. I just uh, I saw something fly there. I did get, so I did see a vulture as well a little bit further up. So I think what we should do, let's just go to that other open clearing. All right.
And so, sorry, I just thought we might have picked up on that noise again, but I don't even see the kudus. So, I think I might just shoot around. Uh, maybe thought maybe old tortoise pan or um, maybe uh, some lions. So, the uh, black dam male lions, it's those two new male lions, uh, they are on Arethusa airstrip. They found them this morning on Arethusa airstrip. So, that's just southwest of us, southwest of Juma property. And uh, they are lying up at the airstrip at the moment. So they haven't moved too far from not yesterday, the day before. So they're still in the area. I'm just hoping that they do come north so we can get to see them again. Yeah, it's still all happening here at Kuriga. Been a nice transition throughout the course of the morning from having uh, those very misty conditions to the humidity shooting through the roof and now a whole lot of cloud cover has come over. Um, so it's been very interesting to, to watch and see everything that's happening. A lot of our animals kind of still moving around doing a bit of early morning feeding. Mm, can see how little zebra fall at the back. <laughs> uh, it looks like it just wants to go to sleep. It's quite funny. But no, it's been a lovely morning here. Uh, plenty of uh, bless book around and about as well. Let me see if I can pan to the side and show you here. Got some zebra there. There's the start of all of our blessed book. Look at that. Stunning, stunning scene. Yeah, so it actually looks like most of our blessed book have kind of bedded down there for a little bit. Um, you know, and maybe uh, maybe we will have cooler conditions today. You know, it doesn't look like too many of them are, are, are bothered with moving around feeding for the moment. We do have a wind blowing kind of the way we're looking from left to right. And you can see how quite a lot of them do have their sort of their bums facing to the left hand side. So kind of just protecting their faces, keeping that out of the wind a little bit. Um, which is quite a common practice to see when, when the wind picks up or even if there's a lot of rain that starts to pick up. Impalas will do that, these blessbok will do that, springbok will do that. Um, so there's a whole different assortment of, of antelopes that will uh, kind of put their backs towards strong winds or rains or anything like that. But the wind is not too significant for the moment. It's just more puffing along and it's actually quite a nice uh, reprieve from the humidity that we had this morning. Yeah, so I think um, I'm definitely going to stick around Scotia Pan for a while here, see if anything does come down. In terms of if the weather conditions do continue to to actually cool down and more cloud cover does come in, maybe I'll kind of do a, a little bit of uh, more driving around and see what else I can find. Um, you know, obviously if, if the conditions are really hot, that's going to drive a lot of... Um, animals down to the waterhole to have a drink whereas if it's a lot cooler a bit of a breeze and a bit of cloud cover coming in I mean there's obviously still a good chance that something's gonna drink uh, just not as much of a chance um, so we'll see what the the weather conditions get up to I mean they're largely gonna determine the movements of the animals and in so doing my movements today but lovely just to have such a, a diversity and a abundance of animals in, in one area here. Yeah, 
Nelly, that's a good question. Zebras do have a good sense of smell. Um, yeah, they've they've got a well-developed sense of smell. All through their senses are actually pretty well-developed. Um, so with this wind blowing from kind of uh, left to right, something like, uh, you know, the scent of lions or something like that, they'd be able to pick up on their scent. Um, in terms of the most well-developed sense for the zebra, um, their eyesight is really, really good. Um, I would probably say more more well developed than potentially their their sense of smell, uh, but for sure they would they would be able to pick up the scent of uh, lion or leopard or anything like that moving across, and you would see they would uh, one would kind of give an alarm call they would all lift their head. Um, you can see there's this little youngster on the right hand side here. Everybody would bunch together. Those bless book in the background that are that are lying down. If a potential threat, a predator walked past, they would all get up and 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 stand, and they would alarm call as well. They wouldn't keep sitting like this. Um, interestingly enough, for those those bless book, there's a pretty good chance that let's say it was a lion walking through the open area, there's a pretty good chance that they would actually follow that lion for a little bit in this open area they wouldn't sort of run away 200 300 meters straight away so the thinking behind that is that they would rather keep a, a view of that predator and know exactly where it is and all the time alarm calling saying to that lion we know you here um, because remember for any predator they need the element of surprise in order to catch a prey species that's the most important thing um, so by alarm calling they're letting that lion know that that element of surprise is gone and at the same time for those blessed book they're able to to keep a view and know exactly where that lion is whereas you can imagine if they did have to run 200 300 meters off and maybe go down into a little dip or something like that they know that there's a lion there somewhere but they're just not exactly sure where it is um, which obviously then is, is counterproductive for them you know there's a chance of an ambush taking place um, and that type of behavior you'll see amongst quite a few of the different uh, antelope species got a bit of bird life going on as well you can see there's a a female ostrich that zebra on the right it's just behind that zebra it's walking to the right there's a little bit of a dip it's just gone into that dip so we literally just can't see it but then right at the back as well there is a white stalk moving around behind those bless book so a good amount of uh, activity happening here in the open areas uh, close to Scotia Dam I think while uh, everybody's quite uh, quite stationary, quite static, and just uh, doing a little bit of feeding here, let's take you across to one of our other locations. Thanks, uh, Nick. Uh, we're just trying to take a look. We did have warthogs here now on this open clearing. Unfortunately, they have decided to. Uh, oh, they're, they're pretty much very nervous on the outs at the back end. It looks like they're one or two moving, but <laughs> we don't see them anymore. Those, uh, so I think they've just one or two have bolted away there now. It's just to the right there. I think we've still got one there in the picture there uh, in the center. But right at the back of those quarry bushes. Is it? No, it's not. Oh, it is, yeah. You can just see the tail flicking from side to side. A couple of warthogs. Well, the warthogs have been doing a little bit uh, bad on the over the last week. As uh, Taylor had on Marib's taking one, and Steve had a uh, lioness uh, grabbing another one. I think was it yesterday. So yeah. <laughs> but it seems like he has three older ones, and then one piglet, like little youngster. Oh, well, here comes one coming out. Hello. Hello. I see you. Yeah, 
I can understand why they're not relaxed, you know, especially when we're stopping, you know, when we stop somewhere and they pick up on us and they're like, oh, then they start investigating on what are we. You can understand being so small and being preyed upon by many predators, you know, you're not going to be the most relaxed animal. keeping their distance. Mashatu Game Reserve has a glowing reputation as one of the most beautiful reserves in Southern Africa. And now, atop a soaring cliff overlooking the Majale River beneath the groves of Euphorbia succulents sits the stunning new Mashatu Euphorbia Villas. These eco-friendly villas echo their beautiful natural surroundings shaped to match the Mapanu parts of Mashatu. Enjoy earthy glamour with a consciousness for conservation woven into every element of these camps within the 32,000 hectare reserve. Thanks for joining me. I'm on the way away from the leopard dam. The impala is still doing the fascinating behavior that it really makes me. I've learned quite a lot today from this impala. Even with that water, they have no stress. They jump around, up and down. We're thinking from the beginning that uh, it could be maybe dogs that are really getting to that area and make the impala runs away. Even with that uh, animal predators, they still do the best. They're still happy. They're still doing. They still run away, and with that water, they're still happy. It's unbelievable. I believe that uh, is how necessary to be in life. If even if you don't have nothing, you still have to smile and do a normal uh, life. It's unbelievable. I've learned quite a lot today. We are heading slowly to the east. Maybe we might. Who knows towards the SG waterhole? We might uh, see, maybe who knows, buffalo. Maybe buffalo. Who knows? And let's take this opportunity from here, Pride Land, east of the Leopard Dam, over to James and see what he's up to. I am not bumbling. I may look like I'm bumbling, but I am not. What I am doing 
is heading with a purpose towards home so that I might partake of breakfast, for I am now ravenous. I am sure many people around South Africa driving on safari are ravenous. Many guests are about to arrive back at the lodge in which they're staying to a sumptuous feast. And it'll probably be followed by a long slumber and then a gin and tonic and then some lunch and then perhaps another little sleep and then some cake and coffee and then another game drive. The greatest danger you face on safari in one of these sort of lodges where I have worked is uh, the development of metabolic syndrome or type 2 diabetes because the need to feed people to the point of inert obesity by the lodge managers is something that sort of confuses me slightly. There is always too much delicious food to eat and one doesn't leave a safari hungry. Oh, there was a cuckoo. A Jacobin cuckoo which is now absconded. Anyway, I hope that you have enjoyed our little trip out into the wilderness this morning. I do hope that I will manage to find a spotted cat or two before I leave. I've got about a week to go. I'm afraid Kabuki, I missed that. Did you get it, Olaf? Kulu, can I have Kabuki's comment once again, please? Before we end the show and go to Escape to Nature. Ah, thank you for sharing the safari with us. It is our pleasure, Kabuki. Thank you for sharing of your time and effort. So we will see you again this afternoon at 15.30 Central African time. Until then, stay safe and happy wherever you happen to find yourself on planet Earth. Bye-bye. Good morning, good morning, and welcome this morning to Mandikwe Game Reserve up in the northwest. Here we go. Oh, you've got a picture of a lioness moving through the thickets there. Welcome this morning to Escape to Nature. I hope you're all well. We're going to try reposition to get another view of this lioness. My name is Steve, and I'm joined by Rihanna Camera. And as always, we are out and about to find you wonderful scenes and sights here in the wild places. If you have questions and comments, you know what to do. Please send them through so you can keep our... Uh, we can keep the engagement going this morning. We can keep things flowing. But what we're going to do, we're going to go see catch up with this lioness who has gone behind the bush. So, 